Alongside head soccer coach Brian Haddock, John Edwards with you and coach. Uh, season number three for you and I getting inside the studio talking a little bit about the soccer program. First, how was your summer? Good to be back first off, John. Uh, summer was great. Spent a lot of time with our family, took a lot of trips, and uh, I'd be remiss to say was up here a lot doing some summer camps with our uh, youth program. Talk about the summer camps. My son was part of it. Uh, you. Uh, Every year, it seems like that number continues to grow. Yeah, and that's been uh, always a pipe dream for me since I've been hired uh, three and a half or so years ago. And um, uh, it's, it's been the quality of the camp's been great. Uh, the numbers have slowly risen, especially in a sport like soccer when there's so many choices for these kids to really go to anybody's parish camp, high school camp. Uh, obviously, the clubs around town have some good things going. Um, but we try to offer something maybe that's a little bit more family oriented with our camps. Uh, we get a lot of returning campers starting really in essence as second graders. We go as low as second grade and it's neat to see a lot of those youngsters, you know, return maybe as middle schoolers. What I'm seeing that's pretty special is now some of those middle schoolers, you know, a year or two ago coming into Vianney and that's kind of the icing on the cake when you see some of these guys, uh, you know, now put on the varsity jersey or the Vianney jersey, so to speak. Um, and that's kind of the, the sort of program and consistency that we want for the summer summer programs. You uh, some some of you had your boys up here all summer long uh, working some of the camps. You got to see them then. Uh, you guys have now been able to be out on the field for a little bit more than a week or so. Talk about the strength of the program. We talked about it last year. It seems like the number is pretty strong again this year. Numbers. Uh, the number itself is good. We had a lot of returning uh, players trying out for our teams last week. And going back in the summertime, there was some really good commitment out of our uh, freshmen and sophomores last year, currently our sophomores and juniors. Um, not only were they here for their you know, workout sessions and open fields and camp sessions, but they went over and above and did a lot of service for the program by being counselors for those camps. And that's kind of the connection we want to make with the youth in the community, with our coaching staff, with our you know, juniors and seniors who work those camps. And sometimes those kids get just as much out of it as the little kids themselves. Fast forward uh, you know, now, um, we're in our first real week of the season. Uh, tryouts ended last weekend, so really we're just three or four days in with our legit rostered teams. And that whole process is going to keep growing and growing, and we're going to uh, you know, improve and hopefully stay healthy come you know, the first and second week of September where we start games. Talk about the development <clears throat> of some of the players that played the freshman, the freshman sophomore level last year that maybe will be playing some varsity time. And, and talk about the coaching and how, as a coaching staff, you guys are all collectively on the same page as far as how you want the program to be. Yeah, we have uh, a little bit more of a youthful varsity this year. We kept five sophomores. Um, with our junior class, some new faces to varsity, which is really, really neat. So from the, to answer your question about the coaching perspective, you know, that sort of stuff, I think, energizes our staff. Um, the freshmen from last year's freshman teams, it was a very competitive tryout, not just for varsity, but for our B team. Uh, who has about 25 guys on their roster filled with mainly sophomores, but a handful of freshmen who've proven to uh, to be challenged a little bit more. Um, and, and, and again, you know, with those two freshman teams that we still continue to have, it makes every tryout more competitive. And with the competitiveness, it does make it tough for decisions because in the varsity and B team levels, we do have uh, tough decisions to make, cuts and all that. Um, but you know, healthy competition breeds a really good program, and that's just what we want to sustain, whether we're youthful or experienced at the varsity level. For the varsity team, we've got 12 seniors, uh, eight juniors, and uh, five sophomores, and so that's kind of a nice blend of returning leaders, um, but also some new blood, I think, for the future. You uh, graduated a lot of seniors, so this year, your varsity team, a lot of those players will be getting a lot more minutes, and that seems like it's been a trend over the last few years. Yeah. You know, Kyle Diffie, go back <clears throat> two years ago, didn't see the field very often. Last year, played almost the entire season. You'll have something similar to that again this year. We will, all across the board. I'm almost in every position, we're going to have unproven guys, even so much as guys who were members of last year's B team, playing a lot for Coach Weber. And then not just making varsity, but in our eyes, you know, really vying for a starting role. Um, and I think that's great. I think it's, it's great for the program, for our current young guys, you know, to see these five sophomores who three or four of them played in the freshman program last year. 
uh, not just make our varsity, but need to contribute in some way, shape, or form. Our B team guys who played a lot for Coach Weber last year now, you know, being vital members of our starting uh, our starting lineup, so to speak. And Kyle's a great example from 20, uh, 2018, and we did graduate 17 seniors out of a roster of 25 last year. So, you know, it's just, uh, again, that competitive nature is what builds our program. You, uh, with having as deep of a roster as you have, you try to play as many guys as you can. Uh, I've seen over the last couple seasons, you try to keep a very deep bench, especially early on in the season for as compact of a schedule as you play early on. How does that vote out for the, for the players during the course of the season? Does that keep them motivated to keep working as hard as they possibly can in practice? Because for you, you might see something in practice that says, hey, listen, this guy is moving a little bit better this week than he was last week. I want to give him a crack at the lineup. Yeah, and there's a couple ways to go with that. You know, I think that's the, the biggest area on the sideline that I've, that I've grown as a coach. It's real easy to kind of get into the win-loss infatuation with, with that. And, and, and But what you need to understand is that in three months, you got to build for the end. And there's a lot of bumps in the road, but you need to figure out as a coach, if in a, a single elimination tournament or in a district game, there might be a guy that has to give you 15 minutes that nobody knows about knows about and you're never going to know unless you throw him into an MCC game uh, you know allow him to start a game get him a, give him a few extra minutes and a half so that's number one number two John you look at our schedule there's a couple weeks there that the week I'm thinking of is the CYC tournament where you're playing four and five games in, in six or seven days and you have got to you know lower your guard and, and really use your entire roster they are in the spot on the team, so you know the way we see it, let's throw them in and see what they can do in a pressure cooker situation in a CYC tournament game. Maybe it's a CYC you know, semifinal if we're fortunate enough to play in it. We have three games in the CBC tournament, another four during the St. Dominic's week. So you see this, this trend of high school soccer. If you rely just on 11, 12 guys, those kids are going to wear down. Worst yet is that when the going gets tough and you have an injury, you need to kind of know who's ready to go. You, uh, once again, I looked at your schedule and schedules posted uh, online at, on Biani Griff, at, with uh, Griffin's TV. Um, your schedule early on, you don't have a home game. You have one game, but then it's like you, you start at Eureka, you play the St. Dom Super Cup, you play, uh, C, uh, you play in a CBC tournament. You have the CYC tournament. You don't play at home until the end of September. Yeah, and that's so it's like ten yeah. games or so that you'll be technically on the road, but not <clears throat> playing here. Right. Unintended. I mean, that's the mercy of the schedule. Unfortunately, with our unbalanced schedule, you know, one year you're heavier with home games, and one year you're heavier with away games. What I like about that is it really kind of tests your team to play at different facilities, different environments. Sometimes it's grass. Sometimes it's turf. Sometimes it's afternoon at night, and, and it really prepares what I feel our team for the district playoffs, which is such a misnomer anyway. You don't know who's in your district yet. You don't know where you're playing, what's the weather going to be like. So there's a lot of positives, I think, by playing away from the friendly confines of uh, Don Heap Field. Um, but we still, I think, have nine or so home games. The other issue is we are in three tournaments. Uh, so the give there is that you might lose a few home games. But the positive is that you know tournaments, I really think, do physically and mentally prepare you for that district tournament at the end of the year. So I think there's a lot of positives with that. Maybe not so much for our parents or fans uh, or for the seniors who like to have their banners hung up on the fence, but, um, you know, nine, nine home games is enough, I think. You, uh, this weekend, you'll have jamboree time over at Summit. Yes. Uh, what do you expect in, what do you, first and foremost, what is it that you hope to accomplish with the team this weekend during jamboree? Yeah, our jamborees are a neat opportunity really to see our guys against somebody else other than ourselves. Uh, the way it's going to work this year, it's changed a little bit from years past. Uh, the jamboree is at Summit. We've been used to hosting that in years past. We used to play two teams for 35 minutes. This Saturday we're going to play uh, uh, Union for 25 minutes, Limburg for 25 minutes, and Rittner for 25 minutes. And really the goal is just to see everybody play in some way, shape, or form. And then number two, maybe see a few guys in different spots. Uh, one positive I think I can foresee about this group we have, and we like it this way, we, we were the same way last year, is to have our focal point players, whoever that might be, be able to play in different spots. 
Um, roles kind of come to play as the year goes, but the Jamboree's great to see some of these younger guys, a lot of our new faces, play different minutes against different sort of opponents uh, in different positions. And it's nice, again, to see other teams. Over the next two weeks, I would imagine that you have some tough decisions to make as far as how you're going to uh, place your roster before the season opener. Or maybe you don't, and you use those first couple of weeks just to see and you evaluate a little bit more where certain players fall into certain uh, situations. We do. That's exactly what we do. We, it's, and sometimes, in some years, it takes most of the, the regular season to kind of build for that end. Um, but again, it's just almost like a, a, a general version of what we're trying to figure out with the Jamboree, you know, getting guys in, not just against different opponents, but, you know, how does our youngster do in a 1-1 tight game? You know, I think it's easy to play comfortable when you're, you know, up by a few goals um, at the end of a game, but, you know, can that player maybe play out of his comfort zone in, in a big game against an MCC opponent. And, and sometimes it takes the entire year to figure that out. Again, injuries play a role in that. Um, so, yeah, but hopefully there's a lot of positives that come for that. Away from high school soccer, big announcement as far as MLS coming to town. I know you are a big proponent of having that. Now that that's been announced, how do you think that's going to impact soccer here in St. Louis? It, it's going to be immaculate for this town. It's a, uh, you know, the first thing that comes to my mind is that it's long overdue. Um, it was inevitable with the uh, uh, plan that our leaders sought out for that team. Um, but I think the biggest positive is that now our town has a connection from the youth level to the high school and collegiate level, and now a tangible uh, professional team where these kids can see the value of progressing in the game. Whereas before, you know, uh, if it wasn't high school or college, that was kind of the end all say all. And without an MLS team in this town, I didn't feel like there was a connection maybe with the kids watching the MLS on TV. In fact, if you look at my family, you know, the first thing that my kids watch is the, uh, the Premier League on Channel 5 on, uh, on Saturday and Sunday mornings. Now with the St. Louis MLS team, there's going to be, you know, a local connection from the pros all the way down to the youth ranks talked about the Premier League. Who, what do you think about this year so far? Uh, Liverpool and Liverpool. Liverpool yeah. and Liverpool? Yeah. That's about it. That's about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you're not a Liverpool fan, I ain't going to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a great, uh, we, I, I, I really promote that to our players. Our players watch it. We have, uh, in fact, this year we're thinking about setting up a fantasy league amongst some of our players on our team. Um, again, a great way, something I wasn't blessed with in growing up, to be able to wake up on a, on a weekend morning and watch the game. And what a great, greater level than the EPL. But I'm a Liverpool fan through and through, and hopefully they can do something special like last year. Anything surprise you this summer in the Premier League? I mean, they had that, that you know, they had the signing window. There was a lot of ramblings about certain players winding up certain places. But anything really surprised you? Like, teams teams did stack up. I mean, Man City goes out and just buys whoever they want anymore. Uh, something that over the last couple of years you've seen more of. And anything really surprising? Surprising, the more I follow it, not really a surprise. Uh, you know, just something that confirms that I think it's the deepest uh, league in the world. I mean, you could watch any game and, and see the top team in the league, whoever that is, in a dogfight with the last place team, and that's just kind of how the English game is. Uh, one thing that's been kind of neat is that you're hearing about more and more, getting back to your MLS question, more and more of these guys who maybe you're thinking about retiring from the English game coming over and hooking horns with one of the MLS teams, and I think that's going to be also an intriguing draw for our local fans here. You know, whoever we draft, um, I think you're going to have a, a big-time name somewhere overseas join the St. Louis uh, MLS team. And that's kind of a trend that I've been seeing lately. You know, I think MLS is now getting to a point where it's a league to play in instead of just one people just go, you know, when they're all said and done. Yeah, but isn't the MLS for some of those players who play over in Europe right now just kind of like a last-minute money grab? Because you look at some of the top end players, and now you have to determine too, as an MLS uh, organization, you have to determine well, what is the back end of a player's career? Is that 31, 30, 31, 32 ish? And how long do you bring them over here for? Because 
Uh, if you look at Chicago, they brought Braunschweiger in. Uh, he's getting paid $7 million a year. And that, to me, I, I saw him play over the summer and wasn't that impressed yeah. for well, first, $7 million a year. First off, Braunschweiger is something you eat. Uh, the guy you're referring to is Schwein <laughs> Schweinsteiger. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that tells you how much I follow it. You know, John, I think what I think what I what the lure of that is more of a marketing of the MLS instead of maybe the timing of when that player's in their prime. I think the trend is still to have a guy in their prime, a, aka a name we all know, Christian Pulisic yeah. out of the USA, going over to play there. It, it is prime, and unfortunately, you know, when they come back, they may have a little bit of uh, of game left in them. But I think the league uses it more as a face of the franchise. Um, but I, th I, I think that trend is slowly, slowly changing. Um, a la Ibrahimovic, Wayne Rooney, I think has a little bit left in the tank, and they're coming over to play instead of just being, you know, somebody that's, uh, you know, a marketing ploy. Coach, I always appreciate a few minutes of your time, especially early on in the season. It gets more difficult as the season goes along. i got to know this. That for all the years you spent on the sideline coaching, how do you not have gray hair? i got to thank my mom's <laughs> side, my grandpa. <laughs> uh, no, that's just I'm just blessed with uh, being half Italian, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> One of the few coaches I know in the building who actually has hair on his head. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Coach, I appreciate a few minutes. <laughs> Thanks, John. We'll I appreciate doing this every week. <laughs> and Coach Brian Haddock joins us. We look forward to talking to him during the course of the year.